Scientists alone can do little in the developing world. Politicians and entrepreneurs must also get behind them. A laureate who pursued his ideas about quasi-crystals against fierce opposition, Dan Schechtman has equally strong opinions about just how to apply science. You know, it's really incredible how something like the five-fold rotational symmetry could completely change the paradigm of crystallography. I'm really proud of Dan for persisting with his idea in the face of so much criticism. Peace Prize winner Jose Ramos Horta sees science as crucial to the developing world, but only if the politicians can get on board. It's really going to be policymakers like him that are going to influence how science can impact development. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Many people think education is the key, but it's not that simple. So when you come to a field like science, which is considered as an international family, how important do you think that we should convey it in uh, the native language rather than English or some other global language? God, you know, uh, <laughs> frankly, in uh, our native language, like today, I was listening to one of the fascinating topic on proteins. How you are going to translate that into Tatum language? <laughs> so sometimes uh, some of our uh, native languages uh, simply uh, not possible. You have to be practical about it. We have faced this question well over 100 years ago in Israel. When we opened the first university in Israel, it was the Technion, from which I am. And for several years, the Technion did not open because there was a big argument what language to teach in. Should it be German, because most of the teachers came from Germany, or should it be Hebrew? Proponents of German said, well, we have all the terminology in German, and there is practically nothing in Hebrew. Proponents of Hebrew said, well, if we do not develop a technological language here, where will we do it? They won. And we have developed the, um, the vocabulary for technology. And for many years, the Technion was called the Hebrew Technion of Haifa. And the language was in the name. I think that it is extremely important to develop the technology language in new language. You mentioned teaching in your own language. We have 11 official languages. It's going to be really difficult to teach every individual community in their own language. Um, I suppose from a basic level it's easier, but when you get to high school it gets more and more difficult and the resources to translate everything becomes really a problem. So In India, like we have almost like more than 30 uh, local languages and uh, we have been dealing uh, quite pretty well with this issue. That is, most of our primary education happens in our own language. When you are taught uh, a subject like science where the understanding of the basic concept is quite, quite crucial for your development in the future, your native language which um, you have been brought up is uh, quite easier than some other language, you yeah, know, sure. which you, yeah, which you gain, uh, which, which you are taught in a school. Yeah, so but there's, there's a tension there because I mean when I was actually when I was teaching in South Africa I saw this because I was teaching like 12th grade yeah. uh, maths and you know you're teaching the kids and they don't understand what a you know a gradient or a slope is yes. and I switch, I'd code switch to Swana and all of a sudden they understand but yeah. when they take the exam mm. it's all going to be in English. Yeah. And so that's, that's okay. my, um, um, I yeah. think I'm a surviving witness of that. Yeah. I was pretty much taught using Venek, our own language, uh, at primary level, a bit of English at high school. Yeah. So I had a lot of catching up when I got to university. Mm. I mean, English, you, in Germany, you're talking English. Would I survive here with my language if I was taught everything in my own language? Yeah. Do you think there's, the time has come such that each country, particularly in the developing world, should start looking at developing technological methods based on <coughs> challenges that are local, or do you think we should still stick to the old system of education that's international by approach? You are from Cape Town, right? I'm from Cape Town. Right. And we have two South African representatives here. You are two, you're from Pretoria. And you have probably the largest remote education system in South Africa, right? UNISA. What is the name of it? UNISA. 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 Fantastic system. You teach the world. 
You, you can teach every tribe within South Africa. But the point is that you want to reach everybody. Basic education for all is key to development of every country. Basic education for all. Now you have a, a vast uh, reserve of uh, platinum and gold. Okay? You are already world experts on some of these issues, and you have institutes in South Africa that do just that. But to prepare the people to work in these institutes, yes, you have to have maybe more chemical engineering and more chemistry and more physics. Develop the strength of the country. But isn't one of the strengths of the country that it has the problems itself, so it understands the context of the problems as well? You know, countries in Africa understand the problems in the, say, cold chain delivery, and that requires certain technological solutions that if you're sitting in, in you know, Cambridge, you might not understand or appreciate. And those require scientific solutions, but also requires knowing the local context. There has to be a collaboration between the West and the East, or the developed and the developing nation. Right, but the funding might not be there to do that science. Like, and I think you know, there's a lot of these orphan diseases, orphan causes, where there's not an incentive to do research. A lot of them are problems that affect the developing world, like a lot of these you know, Chagas disease, sickle cell disease. A lot of new research hasn't been done, or not the same scope of research that could be done on these, re these problems. Yeah, but in, in those developing nations, they are not even getting uh, enough funding for, to address all those issues. But uh, you know, when you go to some developed nation, maybe they'll be having enough fund uh, for such a long... Uh, but they won't fund those things. There's no funding for that. The funding is for cancer in the US. Okay. In terms of forces from outside, actually, I'm very interested in your perspective on this, uh, President Ramos Horta. You mentioned, I think, in some of your speeches about this idea of an Asian fund for sustainable development, like a regional pooled fund. Did you envision some of that funding going to science and technology research? I uh, put forward this challenge in numerous speeches in the context of the controversy over climate change. Asians, because of the population pressure in Asia, that alone gives responsibility to Asia. Asians, as people, extract a lot from nature, just for survival. So I propose, why not an Asian roadmap on climate change and sustainable development, putting together an Asian fund of $100 billion over the next 10 years, 20 years, uh, investing in uh, saving the forests that Asians destroyed over decades, uh, saving the lakes, the rivers, the seas that Asians destroyed, but also that money goes into innovative uh, research, into technology, renewable uh, energy. Today there's so much liquidity in Asia, you know, from uh, China to India, and technology in Japan, in China, in Korea, uh, that could make Asia really leading the rest of the world on sustainable development, on preventing, you know, the continuing deterioration of our uh, global uh, environment. But for, I'd like to know what difference can I make? And I mean, you mentioned in your master class about the brain drain that happens. So as soon as we actually manage to get along this path a little bit, the people leave and they go to more, you know, nicer institutions with more capabilities to do nicer work. So do you have an idea of how we can firstly influence the politicians to make this a reality? And you know, how do we attract the scientists back? OK. By creating the right conditions for them to come back. I can tell you what we do, or what we do in Israel. We uh, educate graduate students. That means masters and PhD. We do it in Israel. Then we send them abroad for a postdoc position. Then we choose the best to bring them back. The most successful, we bring them back. What is the solution? The solution is to start building capacities in developing countries that will attract the brains back. It's not always about you're not paid enough uh, in, in your home country. The problem is that you don't have the right scientific atmosphere or the environment. You don't have that academic excellence around you. Yeah, but uh, Schickman's answer also for me was a little bit uh, lukewarm in the sense that, you know, he says, oh, but 
they created this wonderful environment where they can go back and go and find the postdocs that left and bring them back. But for us, that doesn't exist yet. So it's extremely difficult to create that yourself to go and fetch these people and bring them back. So I think yeah. the challenge still remains. And so the question now is, how do you think, from your point of view, how your study can be implemented? I'm interested in tuberculosis and HIV-related infections. TB and HIV are real problems which need urgent attention. And science has been done in basic science level, in clinical science level, also in hospitals and public health level. But there's been a lack of faster implementation of what has been discovered by scientists. So I think we need to provide a platform of a good communication where scientists are involved in government and government is involved in basic discoveries. Okay. So you have two categories, scientists and governments. And in your opinion, they should talk. There should be a platform but for dialogue. But there is a very thick layer in between, which are the people that do. And these are the industrialists, these are the companies, these are the entrepreneurs. This is the intermediate between them. You don't talk to governments. You talk to industries. And that's true for all of you. In uh, poorer countries, uh, even in a country like India, it's not so easy uh, to convince the corporate private sector to finance something that uh, doesn't have immediate result. Therefore, uh, the government is the best, the, almost the only potential source of uh, funding for research. The key is that the student, the academic, the aspiring scientist is smart enough to identify who in the government, who among the politicians is the most inspiring, the most promising, charismatic. Go and talk to him, convince him, make him your advocate. And if he's convinced by your project, then he will be the one, together with you, we will lobby the prime minister or the rich corporate sector uh, to put some money in your uh, research. So I think that uh, the underrepresentation of the scientists in the government bodies is a problem. You don't expect the politicians to understand each and every word the scientists talk to because uh, we are talking a different language. So along with the industrialists, scientists should be finding uh, you know, some representation in the government bodies. It, it is one of the answers to the issues which we are facing right now. So the government, the industrialists, the society, everyone should be you know, contributing uh, to that. Oh, you will go to the UN. No question about it. <laughs> Okay, fine. My work, one of the difficulties is that it's on sickle cell disease, which is a neglected disease. There's not much funding out there globally Why? because it affects mostly people in sub-Saharan Africa. I understand. Not enough money. Yeah. Okay. So one of these issues is why I was very interested in this Asian Development Fund is, actually, a quick question to all of you is, has anyone here heard of the Global R&D Treaty? Anybody? Global R&D Treaty? Yeah. I did not hear about it. Yeah. So I think this is a big problem. This is a, the WHO was negotiating with every country contributing 0.01% of their GDP to fund basic, or basic and applied research in global health issues that are neglected, such as sickle cell disease, chagas, leishmaniasis, all these things. And almost every scientist I talk to, and even other people don't, have never even heard of this. And it was tabled, it was kicked down the road five years by the US and Europe. But if scientists were more engaged or knew about these opportunities, and we could say to the community, yes, we want to do this research, and we would do it. You know, we want to work together and solve these problems, but we can maybe have some more influence on the policy. Okay, so it's again the scientists vis-a-vis -vis the politicians. The companies in between. Not for those things, though. They weren't, I don't think, necessarily thinking outside the box. Yeah, you that's know, right. In terms of like... Yeah, that's right, yeah. But uh, Shetman was quite inspiring on the fact that, okay, you don't have to wait for the government or the you know, funding bodies to... Go oh, but they did, but the thing is, there's a lot of these research things where they haven't, where these other industries haven't come in because they won't, yeah. because there's no money to be made, yeah. yes. there's no one to exploit in these things. Yeah. So but that's where you need these other policy yeah. solutions. Both of them were thinking politics and science are two different channels that, uh, you know, parallel channels that, that will never meet. I think we have to, you know, get out of this ideology and have to be, there have to be a meeting place of both. Yeah, I think the attitude mm. is there for that already, but yeah. nothing happens. Yes. So these yes. are brilliant ideas and concepts mm. and structured and well thought out, but yeah. in terms of real difference, how are we really going to make an impact? That's, mm -hmm. Well, that's and I think it comes to education. We talked yes. a lot in the discussion about how we need to educate yeah. the public about yeah. science, but I think that scientists need to know more about the policy and get more involved. 
I thought one of the things that was interesting is as scientists we don't necessarily know about the policy that we can affect. Like nobody knows about the global R&D treaty yes. and we're not in getting involved in the politics but like check and talk about that. These are obviously some of the best and the brightest of their countries and uh, I believe there are many more like them. The governments in their respective countries should cherish these young scientists. What they are doing, they are finding solutions to problems that affect uh, humanity as a whole.